right, I am excited about getting into the book of James. You say, well, Pastor Bob, we already finished uh, most of the chapter and, uh, of one, and we still got uh, four more chapters to go. Well, you know, that was kind of the introduction. You know, James was setting us up in chapter one so that we could clean some things up in our spiritual life. Uh, you know, in chapter one, we, the first thing we saw were tests and trials, things that come your way and my way that God allows because God is trying to mold us and make us more like Jesus. And so there are things that come in our life and sometimes they're heavy, sometimes uh, they're new to us, sometimes the burden is something that we never bore before, and yet around us are people who have lived their Christian life a long time and they have gone through many hard trials. And so here in the church called Genesis Church locally, we have people who are seasoned saints. They are people who have walked with the Lord for many years. They accepted the Lord Jesus and all through life they have walked with him. They have faced trials. They have faced difficulties and they're still alive. They're still here this morning this morning, and they're willing to help you who are new in Jesus. Because maybe you haven't hit a big trial yet. Maybe a big test hasn't come yet, but it will. It will because God says all through our Christian life, we have varied tests that we go through. And then we looked at temptation, the other side of that, where we can allow the flesh, the world, the devil, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, those big five enemies of ours, to affect us. And we yield ourselves to temptation, and we step outside of God's plan, and the need to come back to repent, to walk in a good way, to walk in a powerful way. Those are the things that we saw as we're beginning this chapter, and as we have moved through the first 18 verses. Verses. And so this morning, we're going to finish up chapter one, and we're going to begin now walking. James has set us up now to live the practical Christian life. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to talk about the practical Christian life. And it's going to be a conversation through chapter 5. It's not just for this message. It's going to take us to different topics, things that you and I need to look at at Genesis Church so we know how to treat each other. We know how to walk with Jesus. We know how to be powerful in our walk with Jesus. And we understand we do kingdom work for Jesus. And so James is going to help us on a very very practical way accomplish that by hitting some things that at times are really going to be tough to hear. And you and I, when you look at the book of James, man, James pulls no punches. James gets right to the source and, and he hits it. So we're going to go through the book of James. I want to teach you something this morning, something that I teach in self-confrontation. So if you take the self-confrontation class in the future, uh, you'll hear this a lot. But I want to introduce two short phrases to you, and we're going to see it over and over again in verses 19 through 27 uh, here in chapter 1 of James. The first uh, two little words typhonated together, put off. Everybody say that out loud with me. Put off. The other thing we're going to see is, are, are two little words hyphenated together, put on. So say, put on. Okay, you need to get those two words in your head, uh, those two little phrases, because as we go through the book of James, you're going to hear me say it a lot. By the time we're going, by the time we get to chapter 5, you're going to say, oh my goodness, does he have to say it one more time? Put off and put on. We see a bunch of them here uh, in the book of James. So we, I got five short things for you this morning. Nothing long, nothing heavy, but some things to think about as you and I walk in our Christian life. Number one, knowing this, those are the two words that are in quotations, okay? When you look at verse 19, if you are using an ESV Bible like we use here, not that you can't use another version, but you'll notice it says, knowing this, knowing this, here's the big long point, okay? Knowing this takes us back 
to our salvation. Knowing this, that those two words in that verse uh, take us back to verse 18. Look at verse 18 with me of chapter one. Of his own will, he bought us, brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now knowing this, my beloved brethren. You see, here's our transition. James has set us up. He has set us up to overcome tests. He has set us up to deal with temptation. He has set us up to remind us in verse 18 of our salvation. And now he says, because you now know all of this in these 18 verses of chapter one, now we're ready to move on. So this is a moving on transitional point that I want to make. Knowing this takes us back to our salvation that we see in verse 18. Now this new birth, as we look back at verse 18, brings about a new life. You and I have been transformed in Jesus. And because of that transformation, we are able to get victory in chapter 1, verse 19, all the way through chapter 5. Even though it's hard to hear, even though we're going to find our, 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 our shoes are going to get scuffed a little bit, even though we find that God's going to be very direct with us, he is trying to help us become the type of believer, the Jesus follower that he wants us to be, that God wants us to be. So when we look at this portion of scripture, it all hinges on the new birth. If you don't know Jesus as your savior yet, maybe you're listening today and you just started tuning in over the last couple weeks or months. Uh, I had someone tell me at a cemetery this week that, hey, you know, I listened to my church at eight o'clock in the morning and I can't wait to turn on Genesis at 930. That was really encouraging. So I know you're watching out there and we want to make you feel welcome too. But so maybe you're watching, maybe someone in this room, some people have not made a decision yet to trust Jesus. Now you played the religious game for a long time. And we're going to talk about that as we get to the end of, of this chapter. But you, you played the religious game for a long time. You've gone to church, you threw in your cash, you know, you went to the catechism class, you know, you kind of got there whether you went on a weeknight or a Sunday morning and you say, Pastor Bob, I don't know what's wrong because I can't change. I, I've been called up in religion, but it's not doing anything for me. Guess what? Religion will never do anything for you. It's the relationship in Jesus that brings change. And so I want to encourage you today that as you listen to me, allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak into your life. If you're not a believer, I hope that all you'll do the rest of this sermon is say, Lord Jesus, help me understand salvation. Lord Jesus, help me understand salvation. So you may not hear another word I say, but the Spirit of God is going to drive you crazy in your heart. Listen to him. Listen to him. He's more important than I am. And when the Holy Spirit is touching and tugging, make sure you are listening. But you see, the day you reason that religion isn't doing anything for you is because it's all centered around man. We've created a lot of idols in America, and one of them is the church. We have developed in the church this idea that we will tell God when we're going to worship, how we're going to worship, and when he's convenient for us. And God says, I don't work by that plan. And so we need to change. And that's what James is going to be all about here. And we change because we have a new life, that new life. Look at verse 19. Knowing this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now here's what you need to understand in the context of James about those three things he mentions in this verse. First of all, he says, everybody be quick to hear. Now what you and I have to do today in the 21st century is go back to the first century. Because the first century did not have the New Testament Bible as we know it. So when Paul would come to town, when Apollos would show up, when Peter would be there, when John would be there, when someone else would be there, they would be bringing the word of God, whether it was written by Paul in a letter that we call 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Romans, whatever. They would bring the letter and what they would do is they would read it out loud. Or a person would come and they would expound the word of God in the first century. 
They would give the truth of the word of God to the new believers because nobody could open their New Testament Bible. It did not exist. And so what James is saying here, as you grow in your Christian life, the first thing I want you to do is make sure that you are quick to hear. Be quick to hear the public reading of the word of God. Be quick to hear the public speaker who comes with the word of God. Be quick to listen. And that's the second thing he says there. He goes on to say, slow to speak. Because again, we look through the epistles, what do we see? Paul dealing with a lot of false teachers. Because as they would come with the written word, as they would come to speak the word, false teachers, as you read the New Testament, they were creeping into the church trying to say something. In fact, the Corinthian church was so bad at it, everybody was trying to say something. And Paul said, be slow to speak. You need to listen to the public reading of the word of God. Don't everybody come in shooting off your mouth about what you think you know. Come in and listen. Come in and hear the word of God. And then he goes on to say, be slow to anger. And it's interesting with that word because it's the idea of an opinionated anger. The idea of an opinionated anger. Let me tell you. Last year and this year, we got a lot of people with a lot of opinions. <laughs> and how much anger do you see on Facebook from Christians? How much anger do you hear in churches with Christians? What does the word of God say? I want you to stop talking, start listening, and don't open your mouth to give an opinionated argument about something. Listen to what the word of God is saying. If you want to change, if you want to be different, if you want this new birth from verse 18 to mean something, you have to have an attitude to the word of God. You have to have an attitude that I'm going to be quick to listen to the word of God. I'm gonna be quick to be quiet when I hear the word of God and I'm not gonna get angry as I hear the word of God declared. I am going to listen and I'm gonna listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna listen so that I can be heard. I brought this chair up here. We got a lot of props up here today because every one of them I'm gonna talk about from this portion of scripture. So I brought my chair, one of the chairs from my office, and I brought a little baggie with two cookies, okay? Now what I wanna say is I think back to college, okay? I went to college 1976 to 1981, and then I worked for the university until 1984. And then I took my first church for nine and a half years, and now for 25 years have been here. And so here we have these cookies. Why did I bring these cookies? Because when I was in college, there was something that happened almost every day in the snack shop. It was called snack shop theology. Because all of us young bucks who knew not much about theology got together thinking we were going to solve the theological world. And we would sit and we would argue and we'd have debate and we'd do this and we would do that. And in our maturity, immaturity, as young men, while we're munching on our cookies, crackers, or drinking a Coke, we would sit there and try and out debate each other, try and out debate one another instead of really listening and learning as a young person from people who were skilled in the word of God, how to apply the word of God. I, I have up here on the screen some verses. I'm not gonna turn to all of these verses. So if you wanna jot them down real quick, you can do that or maybe find them later on. But all these verses talk about anger. All these verses talk about what anger looks like. And so we'll lift the screen up there for a second as I read through them. You want to write, write them down, pick them up later. Proverbs 13, 13, Proverbs 10, 19, Proverbs 14, 29, Proverbs 29, 11, Ecclesiastes 7, 9, Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2. Those are just a few verses that talk about anger, talk about the foolishness of anger that we see in the word of God. So immediately, James is saying to you and me that the first step in growing in your faith is to stop talking and start listening and forget about arguing about the Bible. You know, I'm at the place, folks, as your pastor, and I have some things coming down the road 
You know what I'm looking for in Genesis Church? I'm looking for young men and women who believe the call of God is on their life and they want to grow up to serve God in some way. And I say grow up, I don't mean that if you're 20 or 30, 30 you're not growing up. I mean growing up in your faith. I want to be the kind of church as we go forward in this new year where we are looking around for men and women of God who feel, call, feel called of God, that we might train them to take on ministry in this church. I am tired of the snack shop theology in this world where everybody wants to sit around and debate the word of God and not get up and do the word of God. We need a church that is doing the word of God, not just talking about the word of God. I want to see people come on staff in the future who say, I believe God has a call in my life. I want to serve God. I'm going to pick you up and take you under my arm. Godly men and women in this church taking you under their, their arm so that you can become a servant of the Lord. There might be a missionary sitting in this church that someday God is going to call to another part of the world. I would love us to be the church that's the sending church, the home church, the giving church, that we send out missionaries, that we send people to the world that they might hear the gospel. That's what this church should be about, that we are declaring the word of God. Whether we're growing up people to serve God in our own nation or we're growing up people who feel called of God to go to another nation, that we become the type of church that's a New Testament church, a Holy Ghost empowered church where we're going to do the work of God. And we're not going to sit and have snack shop theology about it. We're going to get something done. You want the call, you believe the call of God is on your life, you need to come and talk to me. Why do I bring people up on this stage? Not for a show. I hear about these people. God's working in their lives. When you see people up here sharing, Max shared last week, other people have shared. We're gonna have more people share. I am looking for the voices who are telling me about the people who love God. Because those are the people I want to give a chance to be on this stage doing ministry to see what God is going to do with their life. Because this is where it begins. The opportunity for people to serve God. So man's anger does not mix with God's righteousness. Look at verse 21. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. By the way, here's the first put off and put on. In verse, 19, in verse 19, it says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and put off anger. Put on, not speaking, slow to speak, and listen, and be slow to anger. Why? Because anger, put off, does not work, put on the righteousness of God. Both of them cannot coincide in a believer's life. And so we're either going to choose to be angry, or we're going to choose to live righteously. And that's what God is telling us here. The therefore in verse 21 takes us back to verse 20. You see how it's building? This is what we're going to see all through the book of James. James is going to build and build and build. And he's putting a life together called the Christian life that you and I can become. Therefore, or for the reason of this, make sure that you are not living out anger but you're living out the righteousness of God. So the second major point is therefore, or for this reason, okay? I'll say point one again. Knowing this takes us back to salvation. Point number two, therefore, for this reason. And now he's gonna go on and he's gonna talk a little bit about this. And he's going to talk about now some of these put-offs and put-ons. So if I forget to mention the two words put-off and put-on, you're gonna catch them now as we go through this portion of scripture. The first thing he talks about here is getting rid of dirty clothing. How many of you have washed baskets filled with dirty clothing? You know, some of them can be really soiled. Some of them may not be as soiled. And uh, if you're like me, but you're going to learn a lot about me through this passage. If you're like me, I am OCD about the wash. When I move toward the washing machine, my wife gets out of the way. Okay, because she knows I'm going to be determined to do that wash. We spent a few days with some friends. Last night when I came home, in order for my OCD to kick in, in order for me to be able to manage everything, I washed everything that I took with me, including my coat. So I woke up today, everything is pressed and in order. 
And that's how I start my day. Now, if that's crazy, that's okay. I'll, I'll let you say that. But uh, what, what, what is God saying here? In this verse, he's saying, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. So if I let anger build, do you know what happens? Filthiness and rampant, rampant wickedness get stronger. And so he says now, I want you, in light of this anger, I want you to put these things off. Put away or put off these things. Get rid of the filthiness, the dirt that's in the Christian life. This wickedness here that he speaks about is accepting the prevailing wickedness around us. Accepting the prevailing wickedness around us. Letting the influence of the world have its way through our front door and into our lives. And so here James is saying, I want to encourage you now that you're saved. I want you to listen to the word of God. I don't want you to open your mouth while you're listening and don't get mad because you want to say something when you should be listening. Because if you let anger take over, you're going to make some decisions that are not going to be good. And so he shows us here that we got to be careful. We need to grab on and hold on to moving forward. Look here at the next verse there. It says in verse 21, the next phrase, with meekness, receive with meekness the implanted word. See the put off and put on? So if I'm not to do wickedness, and I'm not to be angry, Lord God, what am I supposed to do? Sit down and be quiet, listen to the word of God with a meek spirit, hearing the word of God for your life as the spirit of God is trying to teach you so that you are able in that spirit of meekness, you are getting a hold of the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So here's a plant. If you think it's real, it's not, okay? But I'm using it for an illustration. The implanted word means that when you plant something in the soil and it begins to grow and it begins to blossom and it brings forth fruit, that's what he's talking about with the implanted word. Now, we're not gonna have time to do this, but write down somewhere Mark chapter four. Mark chapter four, because go back and read that later, not now, you need to be listening. Uh, God, okay, you got that. Uh, anyway, uh, but you go back to Mark chapter four, he talks about the seed. The farmer comes along and he throws out his seed. Some lands on rocky soil, some doesn't land on, it lands on the road, it's immediately eaten up by the birds. Some of it gets caught in, 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 in weeds and thistles. But then he says, but some gets in the good ground. And what does it do? It brings forth fruit up to a hundredfold. So what James is saying here when he talks about the implanted word, how do you and I know we have the implanted word? Because we accepted Jesus back way back in verse 18. And when we accept Jesus, who comes into our life? The Holy Spirit of God. And what does the Holy Spirit of God do? He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so we find here that the Holy Spirit of God is now in me. And so when I get called up in what I should put off and I know what I need to put on, the Holy Spirit of God's gonna convict me. Why? Because the word is in my life. I've been born again. And because I'm born again, the Spirit of God is in my life and he's going to convict me so that I become uh, more fruitful. I let the Word of God get in my life. When some people say to me over the years, Pastor Bob, sometimes I really struggle whether I'm saved or not. Well, tell me about that. Well, you know, I, 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 do you get convicted by the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I do. do. You know, and I go through a list and I say to them, well, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is probably a key that you know Jesus. Maybe we need to look a little bit deeper as to why you might not feel saved today. But the Holy Spirit of God, if you do not have any conviction, you probably are not saved. I'm not saying that to judge you. The book over here, the Bible's saying that. Because when the implanted word is deep down in my heart, it's going to sprout fruit. And fruit is going to come out. We read about the fruits of the Spirit. We read about other things about the fruit in a believer's life. Uh, we see that come out. 
So James is saying here, I want you to put off this idea of filthiness. I want you to put off this wickedness. I want you to put on meekness. And you know what meekness is? Meekness is gentle consideration. Guess what? If I'm mad because I open the Bible and God tells me I'm doing something I shouldn't do and I get mad of God at God and close the Bible and storm off, that's not meek contemplation. Meek contemplation is where, oh God, oh man, God, I'm so convicted about this and I'm so messed up in this area. I just need, what do I need to do? What does a meek person do? He doesn't shoot off his mouth. He listens. Go back to verse 19. Be quick to hear, slow to speak. Take on meekness. What is God saying to you? Not what he's saying to your neighbor, not what he's saying to all the other church people. What is God saying to you? And so when I have that contemplation, the word of God is in my life because that meekness then there in verse 21 is going to be the implanted word. And look what it says. It is able to save your souls. Not save your soul in the sense of salvation. Now, yes, maybe you need to hear the word of God and be saved. Maybe you're not there yet. But saving our souls in everyday living as we yield to the word of God as believers. So we see here again this other put on and this other put off. And then he says, here's the third major point, practice the word of God. How do I keep myself meek instead of loud and angry? I need to practice the word of God. And so he says, I'm challenging you believers because we're going to get into some ugly stuff in the rest of the chapters. So learn now to be quiet. Learn now to listen. Learn now to be meek because it's going to get ugly a little bit when the Holy Spirit of God's going to work through the next chapters. And he goes on to say here then in this verses 22 to 25, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Okay, there's the put on. What happens if we don't? We deceive ourselves. Put on's put off. I don't want to be deceived. Therefore, I must put on being a doer of the word. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and forgets what he was like. But the one who looks at the perfect law, for us the Bible, the law of liberty, and perseveres through tests and temptations, not being a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he's doing. When I get through my trial, when I get through my temptation back in the first 17 verses, when I get through that and I begin to stop and not think I know it all, smack shop theology, and I listen to God, and I listen to other believers who probably do know a little more than you or me, then as I listen and do the word of God, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. You know why you don't feel blessed this morning? You're probably not obeying the word of God. Now that sounds harsh to say, but remember, I'm in a harsh book, okay? James is up front. So sometimes I'm just going to be up front. I got to say that to me too. Pastor Bob, what's your deal? You know, you feel miserable? You better look at your heart. What's the problem here? Okay? So James is going to be real tough with us, man. He's going he, he, he's to be like a coach. Yesterday afternoon, now I know nothing about sports. You all know that. But yesterday afternoon, we went with some friends to the movies and we watched the story, the true story of that football player who became a quarterback for, I forget what team. Uh, but anyway, it was a moving story. I sat and cried through the last half of the movie. Okay? So, but he was a football player that started later, became a quarterback. And he won a Super Bowl. I think they won two Super Bowls. But I remember in that movie, the coach, he was tough. He was tough on this guy. And this guy couldn't understand, why is this coach being tough on me? Why is this coach not letting up? He, in fact, he said at one point to one of his friends, I think that man hates me. And then one day, the coach picked up the phone and said, now you're ready. Now you're ready. Do you know why some people are never ready to be successful in the Christian life? They're not listening to the coach, the Holy Spirit of God. They're not listening to the coach. They're the player that knows it all. They're the hog ballers, you know. They're the ones who, who, who go out there and if it wouldn't be for them, no team would be successful. 
And yet, when I, I thought about that movie, I thought, man, O'Day, you know what? God knows when we're ready for the job he gives us. God knows. Some of you are getting close. God's tugging at your heart. He wants to use you. You need to let him. You need to let him. Give it up today. Give it up. The coach is right. He's ready for you now to serve. You need to give that up. But we find here that uh, James goes on to say here, not to just be a doer of the word and be deceived because we're like a person who looks in the mirror. I brought these things a while back in the message. You probably remember this. Okay, these are all my morning rituals. Okay, so when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is shave. And then I go and I take a shower. And then when I'm done with my shower, I put this on my face. I put my deodorant on. Then I put this on my face. Then I dry my hair and I fix it all up with these two things. And then I put this on my knee because sometimes my knee hurts. And then I got my, uh, uh, my little stimulant sticks here with my floss and my electric toothbrush. Oh, and my comb. Oh, and the thing that gets things out of your nose. Uh, now, you know what happens? If I do not look intently into the mirror and look to see what needs fixed, I come to work and somebody will say, Pastor Bob, come here. You got this hair hanging out of your nose. You know? But if I would have looked intently into the mirror that morning, I would have taken care of that problem. Pastor Bob, you smell today. <laughs> if I look intently, I'll be ready. And that's not a commercial for Aaron. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> that's what James is saying here. The person who looks at the mirror and walks away forgets. But when I bend in, and that's the word for intently here, when I bend into the mirror, what's happening? I'm getting a close up. And when I bend into the mirror and I let the mirror show me the truth, then I can make the correction. When I bend intently into the word of God, the word of God is going to show me the truth and it's going to clean me up. So James is saying here, and by the way, he uses the word brothers in this passage. It's a, that's, a, that's a word of, of love. That is a word of caring for Christians that he's talking to. So I don't want you to think here, James is in a boxing, boxing match. James here is saying, dearly beloved. He loves them. He cares about them. And so we see here that I need to look at the penetrating power of the word of God needs to change my life. And the only way it's going to change my life is I go with a gentle spirit, I close my mouth, I open my ears, and I don't get angry at what God has to say, but I look intently toward the mirror, the Word of God, so when I do put on the things I put on, I walk away ready for the day. And so James is telling us here in this passage of scripture, that's what we need to do. I love step three of the recovery process. We made a decision to turn our wills and our lives over to the care of God. That's looking intently in the mirror. I am turning my will over to the word of God, to God, the care of God. And now, by the way, that was point number four, freedom, in case you missed that. Uh, verse 25 there, practicing the word of God. And point number five, the outcome is clear. Look at verses 26 and 27. If anyone thinks he is right religious and does not bridle his tongue, what did he tell us to do back in the verses? Be quiet. If he doesn't learn to bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. But religion, verse 27, that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. What's the put off here? Self-exaltation. I got my religion. Or am I going to care about others and what God says in verse 27? 
Am I going to put off me and am I going to put on others? And am I going to care about others? Am I going to care about God, honoring God? That's what I want for my life. You know what's going to help you and me in our Christian life? We need to listen more to the word of God, stop arguing with God and stop talking to God about what we want. And then you know what we need to do when we do all that? We need to get up and care about honoring God and care about people. Loving God and loving people. And so James takes us through this portion of scripture and he shows us here that I can build a better relationship. My relationship is going to be different toward God and different toward others when my relationship is right with God. James is encouraging us here as we finish chapter one, as you go through tests and as you go through trials, as a believer, know that you need to stop and listen to the word of God, meekly submit to God, be quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. And as you have that mind before you and God, you're gonna have the greatest Holy Spirit teaching moment you've ever had because God's going to reveal himself to you and God's going to show you what he wants to do with you. Folks at Genesis Church and people listening this morning, God doesn't want to see you just sit and sour and soak. God wants you to rise up as men and women growing in the word of God that you might care for widows and orphans, caring for others and keeping yourself unspotted from the world that we have a testimony of who Jesus Christ is and we live that kind of life. Maybe this morning, as I said at the beginning, you're not there on the journey yet. You do not know Jesus. And you're saying, Pastor Bob, I am tired of religion. Jesus Christ will change all that this morning. All you need to do is say, oh, Jesus, be merciful. I know I'm a sinner. I've been trying all this on my own. I've been trying to tell you what to do, Jesus. And this morning I'm coming to you and asking you to be my savior. That's as simple as, as it is in your own words. Come unto me all you who are weak and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. That's what Jesus says. Dear Christian, God has something for you and God has something for this church. And as we go through the book of James and become strong men and women of God, I pray that whoever you are and however God's going to use you, this needs to be a church of not a popularity preacher. I don't need to get up here and do whatever to entertain you. I need you up here declaring the word of God. This is our stage. This is where God wants to use you. Like I see God using people up here. God wants to use you in kids ministry. God wants to use you in student ministry. He wants to use you in the cafe. He wants to use you in a life group. He wants to use you in Genesis University. He wants to use you in men's ministry, women's ministry. He wants to use you in the community. He might want to send you to the mission field. He wants to use you in the digital world, getting the media from this church out to people who are not able to come. Folks, God wants to use you. And I'm telling you as your pastor, when you believe the call of God falls on you, you come to me because we're gonna take you and we're gonna help you and we're gonna mold you to become leaders in this church as men and women of God. This is not a one person thing. This is all of us serving. But we have to do like step three says. I gotta surrender my will to the care of God. The altar is going to be open this morning. Maybe you just have someone else you want to pray for. Maybe you're saying, you know what, God, I'm ready. I'm ready, God, to talk to Pastor Bob this week about the call of God on my life. I am ready. I am ready to become a person at Genesis Church who's going to stand up with the word of God, declare the word of God, help new believers grow, help those younger in the faith coming behind me. I am ready. God has molded me 30 and 40 years. I am ready to stand in my place at Genesis Church. I am ready to stand in my place that I might serve God. This altar is open. Allow the Holy Spirit right now, as the, as the worship team comes, they're gonna play a little bit, but allow the Holy Spirit to work, folks. This is between you and God. 
It's between you and God. This altar is just an opportunity. You can make that decision in your seat. But here's what I want to say. Wherever you make your decision at the altar or in your seat, you got to let me know that you are ready to serve God so we can train you. I would rather train 50 people in this church to be servants of God than to get stuffy, argumentative theologians. I'd rather have power in the Holy Spirit than the power in a textbook. And I am ready as a pastor to say, if you are ready, let's go and do what we need to do.